Wasn't that a powerful testimony that Andy gave us around the communion table? And the one thing that I want us to hold on to as we begin to lay out our vision for 2015 is that Jesus encounters each of us with embracing arms of forgiveness because, like Andy said, we have all, like Peter, denied him. And just like with Peter, as he offers us his mercy, he exhorts each one of us to show our love for him by feeding his sheep. That wasn't just for Peter. It's not just for the elders. It's for each and every one of us. Each person, each child of God that has received the grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. So we look to Jesus, the Good Shepherd, as our example. He lovingly carried, cared for the 99 gathered sheep. But he also went after the one lost sheep. So as we strive to have the heart of the Good Shepherd, there is a basic principle that we need to learn. And you can see that on your screen for the next slide. On the bottom there it says, there is no effective scattering without gathering. Jesus exhorts all of us to tend to the gathered sheep so that we can effectively scatter to find the lost sheep. Let's apply this principle to our vision. Our vision includes seeking life transformation by the Spirit of God. Isn't that what we're doing here today? We have gathered to worship, to seek God's Spirit, to seek His power. And as we've been talking about, we do that together. Each one of us has a gift to bring to the altar of worship. And so the way that we are connected to one another uh, determines how effective our worship is going to be. But we also come together to study the Word. We want to be people that are grounded in the Word and do everything by the Word of God. And there's power to come together and do that together. I was just talking to a sister last Sunday, and she was sharing with me what a blessing it was to come here to Sugar Grove and study the Bible. And she was particularly appreciative of Tim Eller and his gift to uh, present the Word in a way that is anew and alive each time that we look into it. And so that's what we want to be about here at Sugar Grove. But we also are connected as we pray together. There are weekly prayer groups that are meeting throughout Sugar Grove to pray for our vision. And we have a group praying daily for our youth ministry. And we have our men that are fasting and praying for 40 days, asking God to grow them as leaders in God's kingdom. How effective are we going to be able to scatter and share the gospel of Jesus if we aren't tending the sheep, if we aren't tending to our relationships and our connection that we have with one another? But also, we, uh, we draw from one another as we build bridges with our community. Again, we are going to do this most effectively when we use our gifts together. God gives each of us skills and talents that complement each other. And if we will use our gifts harmoniously and synergistically together, we will be a powerful force that will build bridges to our community. And finally, we need each other if we're going to create new disciples more effectively. We need to have challenging relationships with one another, relationships that encourage one another and, and hold us accountable and help us to care for each other, our fellow disciples. You know, when I talk about this, I always think about my uh, brother, Glenn Willis. He had such a passion for spreading the gospel and making new disciples, and you weren't going to be around him very long before he was exhorting you to do the same. And my brother, Ron Pierce here, is another brother that has that same passion. We need to be more open, more vulnerable, and more encouraging in our relationships with each other before we can meaningfully connect to the people in the world and make them disciples. So we, how are we going to do this? What are our plans to be more connected here at Sugar Grove? Well, the elders first believe that it falls on our shoulders. The body's connectedness is a responsibility that falls on the elders. Peter tells the elders to be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. Right now, the elders are in prayer, planning and implementation 
with the connection ministry to be more engaged in shepherding the body. Now we realize right away that six guys can't provide meaningful connection with all 600 members. So it is so important that we f select a few folks around us that we mentor, that we encourage, and that we just live life with so that they can be empowered and equipped to shepherd others. Shepherding, yes, is first the elder's responsibility, but we are all called to share one another's burdens just as we've been praying out of Galatians 5. That means that we as members of the body take every opportunity when we gather to make connection with other members in a way that will build them up and edify the body. You know, if we had time, I could tell you about many relationships here that I see at Sugar Grove that exemplify this connection and this sharing with one another. But like Paul told the Christians in Thessalonica, do this more and more. We need to be even more connected at Sugar Grove. There are too many people that are coming and going and never connected. So please be in prayer about this. And I encourage you to come by the table uh, when we're going to meet uh, in the front porch. Uh, Mark and Annette and I will be there to tell you more about the connection ministry and the plans that we have. But like we've been talking about, one of the first ways is to be connected with one another. And Randy's going to tell us about a plan that we have that will enable us to show more hospitality to each other. Randy? Look at the slide up there. It uh, basically it says, it says one of the things there, it says front porch expansion. We're really not going to expand the front porch. It's actually, uh, we're trying to make it more visible, more uh, accessible, a warmer uh, area we can get in and we can uh, connect in and we can, you know, visit with other people. Uh, if you look at our facility, it's been built this way, don't ask me why, but that's just the way it was back then, uh, many, many years ago. Uh, if you walk out this door right here, you take about two or three steps out there, and you're, looking, and you're standing in the middle of the hallway, and you look to your right, and you look to your left. All you see is doors that lead to the outside. You don't see doors going in anywhere else. We have a building that has a lot of classrooms, which is great. We've been blessed with a super facility here, and we want to keep it that way. But our goal is to try to open things up a little bit. so that We want to open the front porch up so people can see it easily. All of y'all have been invited to someone's house somewhere along the line where you've, you're a guest in someone's home. And in that home, you know, when you walk in the front door, typically the first thing you see is a living room. You see people standing around in there. You see people gathering around, talking, and, and that kind of thing. It's, it's something we don't have. We don't have a living room. We call it a front porch, but really don't have a gathering place. Um, I, just, uh, I just spoke with Betty Bowling this morning, just, just for briefly a few minutes, and it just... She just hit me because she is one of the most uh, hospitable people I know. Lou Ann and I have been to her house many times over the years, and uh, she's just very welcoming. And it's just, I mean, to, to kind of give you an illustration, when you, when you walk into Be Betty, Betty's house, you know, we walk up to the door, the door opens up, and there's Betty standing with this big old smile on her face. And you can't, she, she says, oh, glad y'all could make it tonight. And you can't take one foot in there without her giving you a hug, you know, loving all over you. You walk further into her house, and you see this living room. You see a sofa on the right hand, left hand side. You see a few chairs there. You see some family pictures on the walls. I mean, it's just a warm place to be in. You just, you just want to be there. And she makes you feel that way. You see people standing in her living room talking and drinking coffee. Oh, coffee. When she brews coffee, that really smells good. Uh, I tell you, it's just, it's just a neat place to be. And then off to your left-hand side, you have, a, you have a dining room. They have a table with chairs all around it. And, and that chair right there, or maybe it was that. It doesn't matter which chair I sat in. I gained five pounds, I know. Betty is an awesome cook. Betty is an awesome cook. And it just, it's just a warm feeling when you go into her house because she's so, so inviting and wanting to connect people. That's what we're looking for at Front Porch. We're really wanting to connect people at Front Porch. We want it to be easy to get to, very easily to see, so when our guests come here, they can walk right into it. They, they know where it is. They don't have to go in any doors to find it. It's very open, very inviting, very warm feeling, and that's where y'all come in, where you can greet guests there and meet with them, talk with them, share them your lives, share with them. 
because I promise you a lot of them want to share with you. You know, I could tell you all the details about front porch, but I'm going to ask Van if he would just throw the new front porch on the screens here. That's kind of how that might be looking, an open look. Uh, you'll see a little coffee uh, cafe on one corner over there, and, and there's another shot Van has there, and it comes from a different angle. Uh, you know, I, I, I can talk all day about details, but as, as Mark said, front porch area right after services this morning, we will be discussing that. I'll be there answering any questions and so forth like that. But before I let you go, the main thing we want you to remember is that connection, 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 connection. That's what we want to do. We want to make it an easier place to get to, more visible, uh, just a warm, inviting kind of place that we can share with one another on, on a regular basis. All right, thank you very much. All right, good morning. I'm going to give some ministry updates, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, so I um, need to update you on a few ministries. Uh, Sugar Grove Kids, um, Julie started April 6th. Um, it's kind of a homecoming. Are any of them over there? Yeah, Craig's there. Uh, anyway, I want to welcome back Craig, Julie, Nathan, Luke, Sarah, Jacob, all of them. Um, Sarah's my favorite. I just got to say that. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I, 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 but one of the best things about them coming back is I get to see Sarah every week, so I'm, I love her to death. Um, and Mike is going to start June the 1st. Um, Mike, is she here? Uh, she's probably back in Kids Grove. Micah is very, in case you don't know this, Micah is very excited <laughs> to, be, to be, be a children's minister. Um, if you weren't here last Sunday... Um, we have the replay of uh, their talk available online, so please, if you weren't here, spend some time listening to them share their vision. I could stand up here and tell you, but I won't do it justice. So uh, we are excited. We're excited to, for them to be working together, and we think them working together, one plus one is going to be much greater than two. So we're excited about that. Um, Radiant Way, uh, Mark talked about that we're putting a team together. I think they're starting Richard May 1st, right? Um, 30 people, pray for 30 days, um, and they're going to meet a couple of times during that uh, time period to talk about starting to form a vision for the, for the uh, Radiant Way, which is our, the name for our youth ministry. I probably should have explained that. Um, we're going to replace, uh, we will be replacing Jason. Uh, actually, we're not replacing Jason. We're getting another youth minister. We can't, we can't replace Jason, but uh, we're, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're, we will be getting another youth minister. So um, connection ministries. So a lot of activity going on there. Um, I, I, you know that Mark and Annette are working in that ministry. Um, I asked them to send me some uh, bullet points on email. They sent me six. So I'm going to read them. Fill it, I didn't put them on the slide. I'm going to read them really fast. They'll be back there to talk to you about it if you're interested. Um, but here's what they're working on. More structure around elder shepherding, more frequent communication from your elders about direction, restructuring of all host ministries and creation of a couple more within the next year, renewed emphasis on groups, life groups, and other groups like discipleship groups and fellowship groups. That's number four. Number five, planned opportunities for more gatherings that sponsor and encourage congregational wide interaction aside from Sunday morning and Wednesday evenings. Number six, intentional effort to connect new members to groups, to ministries, and to others who will invite them to join in to serving the community around us. So that's a lot they're doing, right? You get that. Um, and they'll be out there, like I said. If you're interested in working in connection, talk to them. Um, we've, we already have three teams that we're forming, um, Front Porch, um, Grand Central, and the Greeters. So uh, if you're interested in working in any of those ministries, get with them. All right, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to spend a few minutes um, talking about membership, attendance, and finances. So I like to call this butts and bucks. Okay, butts and bucks. Um, so the thing about butts and bucks is um, it doesn't tell the whole story of what's going on in a church. There's a lot of things that happen here that we can't measure, uh, be difficult to do, or practically impossible. Let me give you some examples marriages that stay together because of encouragement or teaching received here, children that decide to follow Jesus because of teaching received here, teens that make a godly decision when faced with a difficult choice 
because of teaching they received here. So even though there are some things we can't measure, nevertheless, it's important to take a look at this information and understand what's happening and why. So it's probably no surprise to you if you've been here for a while, we are, we're currently, our congregation is in a decline. We've been in a decline numerically since about 2008. <clears throat> and I want to ask you to do something with me as a member here. I want you to um, own this as a congregation. We need to own that we are in a decline. It's not the elder's fault, although, you know, we might have some responsibility. I've only been an elder three years, so I can't take <clears throat> blame for the whole. Okay, but, I mean, you know, it, it, there's some elder issue. There's some staff. But you know what? It's our issue. It, we own it. We need to own it. So I'm asking you as a member to own that. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about some of the reasons why that's happening. Um, First of all, demographics. So we are an aging congregation. If you doubt that, just take a look around. We, uh, the lar our largest demographic is baby boomers. 28% um, of our congregation is age 50 to 70. Um, so with that demographic, a lot of things are happening in that demographic. Um, uh, you have kids, like if you notice this year, we have 13 seniors graduating. We've had large classes of kids, so that affects our numbers because the, a lot of those kids won't be coming back when they graduate. They're going out, out of town for college. Some of them stay here, but I'd say most of them go away. So um, that impacts our numbers. Uh, we have um, grandparents in that, in that demographic, so they're all visiting. You know, I mean, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll transfer to go be closer to their, their grandkids. Um, so uh, demographics affects our attendance as well as our membership. The next thing is transfers. Um, we're a pretty large church. We're in a town that is vibrant. There is a lot of uh, industry going on here. There's an uh, energy industry, right? A lot of people work in that. It's a global industry. You have people coming and going all the time for work. People coming in, people leaving. Um, in the last four years, We've lost 381 members, but we added 240, so that nets us at about 141 members. In the last four years, that's our loss. Um, so I'm gonna give you some statistics, and I know there's, I'm giving you a lot of numbers, but remember, we're in the butts and butts section, so hold, hold it in here. Um, here's some statistics on those 381 members who have left. 40% of them left because they moved out of town for whatever reason, they, it was a job, personal reasons, um, family reasons, like I said, they wanted to be closer to their family. So 40% of the people that left, transferred out, moved away. 30% disappear. We don't know where they went. They, they just stopped coming. We reach out to them. We don't get a response. We don't know. Personal issues, what? I mean, Mike Pot talked about this a few weeks ago. 30%. Poof, we don't know. So we're working on that. We want, we want to have some shepherding things in, in place so that we're kind of getting early indications of that and, and being able to work with people, right, for that. 30% um, transfer to another congregation. And they're going to do that for various reasons. Maybe um, they moved in Houston, and so they want to go to a closer congregation. Maybe there's something we're doing here that a practice or a doctrine that they don't agree with that we're doing, or maybe there's a practice or doctrine that we're not doing that they believe we should. So it's just, that's just it, guys. People are going to come and go. I'd say the 30% that are, poof, you know, we, we're, we're, we're going to work on that one. And the last one is lack of new disciples. I want to talk about this one for a minute. In 2014, if you exclude the Spanish-speaking congregation, we baptized eight people. Four of them were children of fam of, from families that go here. Four of them were spouses of members. Now, that's awesome. I'm, I'm thankful to God for that. But that's it. So when we start looking at 
creating disciples, um, we have some growth to do there. We have some, some things that we need to be working on in that area. Um, we're definitely struggling with this as a congregation, not only individually, but as a group. So we're working on this. This is, it's, it's, it's one of our, um, if the vision uh, statement was up there, um, create new disciples is a third, is a third verb. It's, it's, it's really important. Um, but I want to I wanna close with this because I think it's important that we remember that it's not about adding members to the Sugar Grove Church of Christ role and getting them to give us money. It's about creating disciples. If you look at that statement at the bottom, I just think that sums it up so well. That if you make disciples, you will always get the church. If you make a church, you rarely get disciples. Effective discipleship builds the church, not the other way around. So Granville now is going to get up and talk a little bit about our bucks. Granville, come on up. Oh. Sorry, Jay's going to get up and talk about scattering and missions. <laughs> so, um, up to this point, we've been talking a lot about how we gain strength um, through our gathering. Now, I want to talk to you about our vision for touching lives outside of the walls of Sugar Grove, part of our scattering vision for 2015. That vision includes, first of all, foreign missions. Previously, we re relied on um, individual contributions, individual gifts, to fully support our existing missionaries. We've only partially funded their support through the operating budget. This year, we're committed to fully funding our missionaries. We'll also be funding mission trips to the places where we support missionaries. Our goal is to develop stronger bonds with our missionaries. And in so doing, we're gonna transform the lives of the people, of those in the mission field, and those going on the mission trips. Amen. Just talk to people like uh, Scott Hendricks, or talk to people, to some of the families that have gone on mission trips. Just ask them how these trips have transformed their lives, and how they've seen God working. We've committed to a total increase of $40,000 in the foreign missions budget for 2015. The Spanish ministry. As you know, Wilfredo Rivera has been leading our local outreach effort to bring the message of Christ to the local Spanish-speaking community. We believe that building bridges to our community, including, includes spreading the good news to the large number of people that speak Spanish in our community. Wilfredo's well, been supported in the past, part-time, part, partly by the English-speaking congregation and by the Spanish-speaking congregation of Sugar Grove. The Spanish-speaking congregation has continued to grow. Um, and, we're develop and it's developing spiritual leaders at this time. To enhance that growth, Wilfredo has been offered and has accepted a one-year contract as a full-time local Spanish minister. Now, during that year, Wilfredo will develop and expand the Spanish outreach. He's also going to work with our foreign missions team to support the Spanish-speaking foreign missions, and he's gonna develop external funding for his, for his Spanish ministry. We expect the fundraising effort to reduce Sugar Grove's support expenses back to its previous level within one year. Wilfredo will be working with the uh, foreign missions steering team, and they'll be uh, uh, directing him. The last thing I'm going to talk about is the Hands of Christ ministry. Our vision is to reach out and meet the needs of our local community. That's both physically, both their spiritual needs and their physical needs. One of the ways that we're touching our community is through the Hands of Christ ministry. Some of the ways we communicate God's love is by assisting 
those in crisis. Supporting the Heritage Rose Elementary Reading Program and by providing local missionary, uh, so local mission, missional outreach events. Uh, those uh, uh, missional outreach events um, fulfill the needs within our community and at the same time, they provide an opportunity for us to talk to people about God. In the past, the uh, Hands of Christ ministry, it's been funded through designated gifts. Well, those gifts have pretty much been exhausted now. So the funding will go through the operating budget. That's how we're going to support it. These three areas, foreign missions, Spanish ministry, and the Hands of Christ ministry, they only encompass a part of our scattered mission. We continue to look for more opportunities to reach out to others. Our scattering vision is a challenge to each of us to step out of our comfort zone and commit to intentionally developing disciples and discipling relationships with those both inside the Sugar Grove walls and outside the Sugar Grove walls. Okay, last week when we explained this to the leadership group, there was some confusion on the leadership's part as well as my part. And so what did I do? I went out and got some buckets to show you exactly what we're talking about and where the funding will come from. <clears throat> okay, this is our budget for 2015. It's $1.5 million. So think of this as your house budget, okay? This is your house budget. This is where all the bills come from. Money goes in, money goes out. So Van, if you would show the first slide, please. Okay, this is the budget for 2015, the $1,506,000. Last year, the budget was $1.45 million. So that's an increase of $53,000. Even though $53,000 is a lot of money to me, it's only 4% of an increase over what we did last year. Now, as has been mentioned, the missions and outreach, that's the $40,000 piece. That is an extra piece and thus an increase. Now, let me ask you right here, how many of you have been on a mission trip? Okay, so if you kind of look around the room, you can see that those people that have done that, it seems to me, have, are changed. My wife and I <laughs> lived in the Caribbean for a couple of years, and we met a missionary family down there, and we have been friends with them ever since. And the excitement that they had for the good Lord is contagious. So I encourage each of you to talk to someone that has taken a mission trip. Now the Hands of Christ ministry, that's the $13,000. And that is the piece that Darlene Willis is over. And this has been explained to where that goes. Now a one year deficit through March is about $19,000. But we're expecting God to show up as he always has. Now, let me talk about the red, uh, the red bucket. Now, this bucket has 
$56,000 in it. It has that in it. That green bucket does not have a million and a half dollars in it. That's where you come in. This bucket has $456,000 in it. Now, let me, say, let me say a little bit about Joanne Badeau. Joanne Badeau was a member here, and several years ago, she put $75,000 into a mutual fund. Now, <laughs> the $75,000 was directed upon her death to be paid to the Sugar Grove Church of Christ. She did not leave any directions as to where the money would go. She started with $75,000. Show the next slide. <clears throat> that $75,000 turned into $456,000. She passed last year at that time, it was $450,000. So it just shows you the power of God. When he's in it, you can't lose. Now that $456,000, we have not spent any of it. Let me repeat that. We have not spent any of the money. We prayed about it. And now when opportunities have arisen, we see an opportunity to invest those funds. So the missionary support piece that Jay alluded to, that's going to be $43,000. The front porch renovations will be $175,000. Now that total will be $218,000, the one seventy-five plus the $43,000. Now, the remaining balance will be $238,000 in that red bucket. Of that, and take my word for it, I've added these numbers up at least 10 times, but I was told last week after the leadership meeting, don't allude to it, numbers that you don't have on the screen. I put them on the screen, but they ran off the screen. It, the, it, the slide got too busy. So of the $238,000, $185,000 will go towards scattering, the scattering piece. We're going to invest 50% and 50%. 50% in gathering, 50% in scattering. <clears throat> so of the $238,000 that's left, $185,000 will be for the scattering, while $53,000 will be for the gathering. So I close with this, that $456,000 started as $75,000 years, some years ago, and it more than, what's that, quadruple, almost quintupled, I guess you would say. So, like I said, you never know the, what God has in store when you step out on faith. Thank you very much. Okay, we're running long. Um, Regis and Smith, you guys don't know how to count to five. I said five and you took ten, but that's all right. Um, we're we're going to move quickly here. Uh, but uh, what I, next slide? Okay. Uh, just real quick. Um, so um, the average household, median household income in Fort Bend County is over $80,000 a year. I looked at the giving for 2014. I took 5,000 people who gave $5,000 in a year and below. And um, those households are 29% of our total of our 307 households. They gave $5,000 or more. That's 79% of our total contribution. So about 30% um, about of our congregation gave 80% of our contribution in 2014. So this is what I conclude from that. Number one, we have some extremely generous people here. 
Number two, we have some opportunities to grow. So I'm not going to lecture you. This is not my intention. Um, I have grown children, so I know lecturing adults does not work. Um, but I'm going to tell you a story about my daughter, Abby. Abby is a junior now in college. She, when she was a senior in high school, um, she wanted to go on, uh, to Disney World on her graduation trip. And I said, sweetie, you can do that, but your dad and mom aren't paying for that. So she went and got a job. She worked at Brook Street Barbecue uh, the spring of her um, senior year in high school, down, Brook Street Barbecue down in Missouri City. When she came home from work, she, she reeked of barbecue like in her clothes and in her hair. And it was awesome. I followed her around. I smelled. I said, come here, let me smell you. She was like, get out of here. You're creeping me out. I'd walk in her room when she wasn't there, and I'd just go, it just smelled great. Anyway, um, so we were in the car driving somewhere, and the conversation came up about giving. And she asked me, well, you know, I'm getting paid. Should I give? And I said, yes, absolutely. You should tithe. And it just came out of my mouth, just natural. So um, that was... She, I'm her daddy, and, and I'm your spiritual daddy, and I'm telling you, if you ask me what you should do, I should, I'll tell you you should tithe. Now, um, uh, you know, we don't need your money. Quite frankly, the more money we have, the more, it seems like the more problems we have. But, um, you know, as elders, we don't need the money. And, and I know us, when staff people get up here and ask for more money, it's just kind of like, you know, well, they want to raise Look, guys, uh, we don't get paid for this. It's, it's a volunteer job. So um, it's not about the money. It's about discipleship. It's about discipleship. Okay, um, so I will tell you that um, all the elders are tithing. Um, Regus, where are you, Regus? You're somewhere. Okay, Re Regus, um, I, think, I think in one of uh, a talk he gave a year or two ago, he, he, gave, he gives over 30%. Now, um, Regus and I have to forbear each other sometimes, right? We don't, you don't always see eye to eye on everything. But let me tell you something. When Regus says something about stepping out in faith, then I listen. So I want to encourage you um, to, to just take a look at what you're doing financially. Uh, move in that direction. You know, you may not get there today. And when you get there, don't be satisfied with where you are. Grow. It's a growth opportunity. Grow. Okay. Um, I think I have one more slide. I know we're really going long, but I have to show this one. Um, so, um, you know, um, in our lives, um, Marcus talked about being out on a limb. We want to be out on a limb in our lives. Um, let me ask you guys a question. How many of you in here have, in your past, made some kind of financial, faith financial giving decision and felt like you were blessed because of that? Raise your hand. Raise it high. Okay, keep it up. I didn't say put it down. When Simon says put it down, we put it down. No. Um, okay, everyone look around. It's, look around. It's okay. Look behind you. I know you never look behind you unless you want to see how much time's left on the clock when Mark's preaching or you wonder who's messing up the, the songs. I know. Um, but just turn around. Look around. See. You want to see which, uh, who, which baby's crying. I, I know. I know. I know why you turn around. Okay, look. There's a lot of people in here. So if you're struggling in this area... Find somebody that raised their hand that you know and ask them to tell your story, because I guarantee you they'd love to. Come to me. I'll tell you my stories. Um, one more thing, and then I'll let Mark wrap this up. Um, you might be saying we're a little too bold. You might be saying we're asking too much from God. And it, if, if I was sitting where you're sitting, I might be thinking that. But let me tell you something. I'd be a lot more concerned if we weren't. Hey, Mark. We appreciate your patience and attention. Um, I know we've gone over, and so we'll uh, wrap it up. But um, I'd just like to build uh, uh, one or two thoughts more on what David was saying. Uh, and to make it clear that we are not asking for you to give more money so that we can have nicer facilities or give more support to our missionaries and ministers. But this is what we are asking. Return to your first love for Jesus. Share your redemption story with others to build them up. Be connected with your Sugar Grove family. Show hospitality. Shepherd one another. Grow in discipleship. Grow in generosity. And grow your missional heart. You know, you may be here, and this may be your first encounter with Jesus, your first time to, to love him. 
And if so, then we want to uh, help you in uh, becoming immersed in water and immersed in his spirit. Uh, but and many of you have, have lived and walked the life with Jesus for many years, and we encourage you to return to your first love. And let's uh, encourage each other as we walk that life of discipleship. So if there's any way that we can help you, we ask that you come while we stand and sing. All who are thirsty, all who are weak, come to the fountain. Dip your heart in the stream of life. Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of His mercy. As deep cries out to deep, and we sing, Come, Lord Jesus. These five elders here, and as well as Tim who's not here, I'm going to pray over, and uh, all of us, let's uh, just join in and call for the blessing on these fellows. Father, we are, uh, again, just incredibly blessed to be in your presence as always. I'm thankful for these guys and the, uh, the love that they have, the energy that they have, that they spend on this body. I'm one of those people that have an opportunity to see firsthand what they do, what they struggle with, how they agonize over so many things. And Father, we are like Jehoshaphat, Father Lidge, <laughs> it's bigger. And we don't know, we don't have the resource to deal with it, but our eyes are on you. 
And I believe that I can say confidently, Father, and I'm thankful that we have men here whose eyes are on you. And I pray, Father, that we will be a body of people that support them, that encourage them, that lift them up, and that, uh, Father, uh, follow their leadership. Thankful, Thank you, Father, for uh, guys that will do that. Thank you for uh, them and, the, and again, Father, the time that they spent. So we love you. We're grateful to you, Father. We hold all this up to you with praise and honor. And it's in your name that we pray it. And amen. <laughs>